Shalom once again, and um, I won't introduce Yehuda, because how can I introduce him? By now you all know him, and those who won't will. But um, I can just remind you all that um, Yehuda said yesterday that uh, utopias are dangerous, because they can create religions. Theistic or non-theistic, they are dangerous. But he promised to say some good things today. So, so we're waiting for you to do just that. So the honorary of um, the Israel Prize, which is the most distinguished prize, Chatan Pras Israel, Professor Yehuda Bauer, please. Well, thank you very much again. I think I ought to start by thanking uh, all those who worked here to make this colloquium the success it is, not was, uh, and uh, say also thank you for the very uh, great kindness that my wife and I got here and are still receiving here uh, before I start off on a very difficult task. Uh, I promise to uh, uh, be a little bit more optimistic than I was yesterday. <laughs> but I didn't promise to keep my promise. <laughs> However, uh, I am really grateful to Amir Hussein because he provided part of the answer. And the answer, obviously, is for 7 million Muslims in this country, let's assume that that is the number, more or less. I mean, who knows how many Jews there are here in this country. Uh, <coughs> those are two communities that uh, can and should be able to talk to each other. Together, they might make a little bit of a difference. But with all due respect to all of ourselves, it is not we who decide what happens in the world. We can have some kind of a marginal influence over that. And that is what we should use. But we have to realize the realities. I pointed out some of them yesterday. And with the decline of America and a multi-centered new globe, we have to see where we could make a tiny bit of a difference. The fact that America is declining in force is not due only to objective circumstances. It is also due to a certain spirit and ideology of an administration that got America involved in a hopeless war and thereby eliminated the military force that America could have used all over the world. You have in this country, I would estimate, I mean, it depends, you know, how you view the National Guard as a, a, a military force, yes or no, or halfway. Say, roughly speaking, about half a million effective military. 160,000 in Iraq plus over that number is rotation, plus Afghanistan, plus all the rest of the commitments that America has, effectively eliminates America as a military force. And in order to restore that force, because America is an important center, is an important power, has great influence in the world, even if it is declining, uh, there has to be a change. You, can, you are living in a democratic country, after all. I'm not so certain that the, that the Democrats will be that much of a difference. But they may be. It depends. And I know some Republicans who are not that far away from the same kind of attitude that I presented. So it's not a question, really, of just party politics. It's a question of the view of a 
huge population of a quarter of a billion people in this country, made up of individuals. So there is the possibility of influencing. You have a deficit which last year was over $400 billion. That is not sustainable for a long period of time. You have a national debt in the trillions. And that national debt, as I said here last night, is in part held by communist China, but they need your market. They can't exist without that. So it's a mutual dependence. It's not just one-sided. And then you have allies and potential allies. Uh, you messed up your relations with Europe, but that can be repaired over time. And your budgetary deficit was created after the Clinton administration. Under the Clinton administration, you had a surplus. In other words, it's not just, you know, dealing with theology and threats and so on. One has to look at the global picture. And when one looks at the global picture, there are not only <coughs> frightful dangers, and there are, but also possibilities of change that can be used. Do people learn from history? I don't think so, except in some special cases. But history does influence us. We you know, the whole, you know, the whole image of time is so warped. We talk about 700, 800 years ago as if that was another age. It isn't. We have the same, they are the same humans. The same kind of psychology, the same kind of reaction, the same kind of desires and instincts and whatever. <laughs> the difference between two and a half thousand years ago and today is minimal. We divide it into ancient, medieval, modern. It's nonsense. Nonsense. It's the same period of time. So when we look at what we call history, we are looking at the present, and therefore we can learn something from it. Now, the dangers that I pointed out yesterday are not the only ones, in case you didn't have enough. Uh, you know... We are ruining our planet, as we all know, ecology. We have diseases that we can't deal with. We have a, um, a, uh, the problem of genocide. I mean, you know, my special area of research, as you know, is Holocaust. And Holocaust was a genocide. And genocides have been with us since time immemorial and before that, in different forms. We are the only uh, territorial predatory mammals that kill each other in huge numbers. I mean, we are just like tigers or bears. Or, no. We are predators. We eat meat, right? fish. We are also collectors. We eat fruit and grass. We eat grass. I mean, what is bread? Grass. So we do both. And we have the instinct of murderers, which are sometimes suppressed, or often suppressed. Sometimes they come out. We have to realize that. So the threat that I discussed yesterday isn't the only one. But it's combined with all the others. So when you deal with one, you have to deal with the other. How does one deal with the radical Muslim danger that I pointed out yesterday in some detail, and I don't think there's much of a difference between us on this panel on, 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 on the basis. Of, you know, there's a lot of slight differences, but... Well, one thing is obvious, isn't it? Namely, that the Jews are in no position to fight that danger alone. That's clear. Anti-Semitism generally is not something 
that Jews can fight alone. Anti-Semitism is not a Jewish disease. It's a non-Jewish disease. And I think, you know, the fact that there's anti-Semitism in places where there are no Jews shows that without Jews, there can be anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, Amir Hussein, I'm sure, knows much better than I do how tremendously popular the image, the stereotype of the Jew as the enemy is in Pakistan. There are no Jews in Pakistan. There was one, Daniel Pearl, and they killed him. <laughs> so you don't need Jews. But interesting, and this is important, you know, anti-Semitism is a, uh, an attitude that you can find only in monotheistic society so-called monotheistic societies. You don't have anti-Semitism in India, for instance, and there has been a Jewish community in India for probably well over 2,000 years. Now, they, they, they had problems, but not because they were Jews, but because they joined the wrong ruler at, at a certain point, so they, they found themselves on the wrong side of the fence. They were never attacked because either their religion or, eth or their eth ethnicity. When I go to India, when we, we went to India last year, <laughs> the typical question of an Indian, of a Hindu, uh, to you as a foreigner is, uh, uh, what is your God? My God is Krishna, or Ram, or Vishnu, whatever. And then you say, well, uh, you start um, sort of mumbling because uh, it's not that the, the question doesn't really fit your, your attitude. But uh, you say, I, I believe in, 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 in moral humanity. That's wonderful, he said. I believe in Krishna. There's no problem there, you see. There was a Jewish community, a small Jewish community in China, in Kaifeng Fu, in, for many years. It, the last real Jew there died at about 900, 1911. There was never any persecution. In polytheistic societies, or in societies that have no gods, like the Buddhist society, Buddhism, Buddhism after all, is an atheistic religion. That's not an oxymoron, because religion is a system of belief. So, um, <laughs> anti-Semitism, you're crazy, huh? There's no such thing. Anti-Semitism is a monotheistic thing. Now, yeah, we've got to remember that. Because... These are, you know, Christianity and Islam are, after all, uh, uh, the father religion is the Jewish religion. So you rebel against the father. I know I'm, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be a Freudian here, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really that kind of an attitude. Um, Amir <laughs> was telling you something about himself. I, I very rarely do, as many of you know. I, mean, I don't think uh, my personal history is that important, but... I, I did spend a year in a monastery because I was a very naive, you know, uh, Palestinian Jew sent by the British mandate to study in Britain. And I didn't know anything about Christianity. I was in a Christian country after all. So I went to a monastery. I mean, they had a student hostel in the monastery. So I joined that. And, uh, you know, I wrote them, accepted me and all that. Uh, and then I came with my suitcase and I knocked at the door and uh, I said, my name is Yehuda Bauer. And he said, yeah, yes, I know, uh, you know, I'm a monk, I, we, we, we got your letter, my name is Father Cohen. <laughs> well... <laughs> My reaction, my reaction wasn't that different from yours. No. <laughs> and he said, well, my grandfather was a Jew, and he came here to Wales, and uh, he married a Welsh woman, and uh, he abandoned his original religion, and then they had children, and one of them was my father. And he said, I'm not going to change the name of the oldest aristocracy on wo in the world. <laughs> so, and then, you know, in 
order to arrive at what I later became, I studied with Gershon Sholem and with Martin Bubba and with Ishayahu Tishbi and mysticism and so on and so forth. And then I took courses in Islam because you have to do that. I was fascinating. And then Ilana and I have between us five children and three of them are boys and three of them are sort of half Buddhists. So I had to study some at least of the works of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. You have to be globalized in every possible way you can. And when you fight radical Islam, you can't fight it alone. You Christians can't fight it. And Buddhists certainly can't, because the Bodhi Buddhism in India was exterminated by the Muslim invasion. The people who can fight that are Muslims. People like Amir Hussein. People, there are millions of them. There are millions of anti-radical, believing Muslims. Just like you and I are believers. A secular Jew is a believer. So are they. That's common ground. It ain't that simple though. Because just as we are split as a Jewish community every which way, so are they. To combine is very difficult. It has to be done. You can't do it for them. They've got to do it. And because there are millions of them, not only in the Muslim diaspora, which is relatively easy, but in the heartlands of the Muslim world, in Indonesia and in Pakistan, you don't have to sub subscribe to the political ideology of Benazir Bhutto. But she wants to fight extremists. So, at least part of the way, there is a common interest. Is she corrupt? I don't know. She can't be more corrupt than the Egyptian regime or the Saudi regime. Possibly she's less, I don't know. But people like that, who want to translate what we inaccurately call Western values, because they are not Western values, what we inaccurately call Western values into a Muslim society without abandoning Islam, without abandoning their tradition, without abandoning their literature and philosophy and, and, and whatever, and art and architecture and all that sort of thing. In other words, not tolerance. I was bristling all over the first night and people were talking about tolerance. I am not tolerant. Tolerance means that I, with some internal opposition, tolerate someone. I want to understand and respect the other, not tolerate the other. So if you do that, and if we can find allies, and we can find allies, amongst the millions of Muslims, we had, <laughs> my wife and I came here from Montreal uh, from another conference on genocide prevention and they had invited young people from all over the world, you know, to train them and to try to do something about this. And we were approached by a young man, a lovely young man, and he said, my name is Jamal. So I thought he was from Syria or Egypt. Eh? Turned out he was my neighbor. I spent 41 years on a kibbutz in the Negev. I, I learned how to ride horses, because I was a cowboy at that time, from uh, my Arab neighbors. And this young man knew my closest neighbors, the uh, clan of Abu Ghayeb in uh, among the, uh, the tribe of Al-Khuzayl. And 
it so happens that their grandson and my grandson are best friends. And when he had his bar mitzvah and my granddaughter had her wedding just quite recently, the whole clan came, of course. That's the kind of thing you can do here. You see? But that's not enough. Because that is local, important as that is, if that's where you start. You have to do it politically. You have to do it on a grand scale. So the first condition then is to get American troops out of Iraq. The second condition is to reconstruct your own general community, not Jewish, the general community in such a way that it will again become effective in the world and that it can talk to others on a level that the others will accept. Not, you know, uh, paternalistically. The second thing is to create coalitions with anti-radical believing Muslims and support them. Don't do it instead of them. Support what they do. And when they ask for help, don't tell them what to do. Don't pay for them unless they ask. But when they ask for help, give it. And encourage them, them to do the things, not you, them. The second thing is the poverty in some Muslim countries, not everywhere, some Muslim countries. I'm not talking about Arab countries. I'm talking about Muslim countries. Because you see, I said it yesterday already, without a modern democratic capitalism, you don't have a modern democracy. Socialism, I was a Marxist, you know, a million years ago. But I remained a member of a kibbutz after I stopped being a Marxist. Because the communal idea, the, the, the idea of collaboration, the idea of friendship, the idea of comradeship doesn't need a Marxist philosophy. In fact, it's opposed to Marxist philosophy. So what you need to do is to create programs that will circumvent the corrupt dictatorships in the Muslim world. You don't want to supply money <coughs> to Mr. Musharraf. You don't want to supply money <coughs> to the Saudi Kingdom. You don't want to supply money to Mr. Mubarak or to Mr. Assad. You have to find ways, and the World Bank did find some ways like that. It didn't follow through. To direct aid directly to the producers to the small farmers, to the, to the shopkeepers, to the small industrialists. Because you see, the thing that uh, radical Islam is built on socially is social networks that function because the corrupt dictatorships don't function. That is how the Muslim Brotherhood got going. That is how Hamas got going. They created networks of medical help, of help for the elderly, of mutual support systems, very effective ones. And people joined them, you know, <laughs> theology, okay, that's good for the university. Uh, the practical things, the day-to-day -day things, they supplied that. They were very successful. And it was needed. There was a need for that. And of course, the price that people paid for it was the madrasas, was the, the, uh, the um, ideological uh, teachings that they spread. You can tell, you can, uh, you can uh, accompany your help, not your help, but through your government, etc., etc., through the major financial institutions. 
help that will be accompanied by education. Not any kind of education. Don't teach them about John Stuart Mill. That's useless. <laughs> Take their own traditions. Again, you can't do that. They can do that. Their own traditions we heard here. From Professor Lasta, we heard it from Amir Hussein, we heard it from Jane. They have whatever we have. We have genocide in our tradition and wonderful moral principles in our tradition. We choose. Let them choose. Provide them with elements of their own tradition to accompany financial aid directed to the producer. This has been picked up by some people, not enough. Uh, I'm a member of an international group of people who deal with genocide prevention. And uh, we try to influence the uh, fat cats, as they call them, uh, in a friendly way in this country. Uh, they have meetings every year in Davos, in Switzerland, and there are some people there who actually got the point. The point, namely, is for the big capitalistic ventures that uh, if people are dead because they are killed in a genocide, they can't buy your goods. <laughs> and if they have a one dollar or two dollar a day or less than that income, they're not going to buy your goods either. So if you want somebody to buy your goods, you have to create a market for it. And there are ways of doing that. So all this kind of thing, that's number three already in my list. The first one was the uh, local network, the second one was the, uh, the uh, uh, creation of, 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 of non- or anti-radical Muslim uh, networks to, f to fight this disease. And the third one is this uh, economic thing. Because without that, uh, you know, without one of the... One, one, one sort of links with the other. You can't do one without the other. It, it, it has to be together. It'll take time to do that, and I don't know whether we have that time. That's where the pessimist comes in. But we've got to try our very best. Does this sound too idealistic? Yes, it does. Can it be done? Yes, it can be done. You have to turn the idealism into real realpolitik. You have to contact governments. You have to make it well understood that unless they undertake certain steps, they will suffer. Now, as a Holocaust scholar, I know that the Holocaust could have been avoided. It could not have been predicted. It could have been avoided, not in the interest of the Jews, you know. I mean, who cared about the Jews? Who cares about them now? But because of their own interest. I mean, the World War II, which was caused in part, in pretty large part, by anti-Semitism, killed 35 million people. Six million of them were Jews, or slightly less than that. But uh, all the rest were non-Jews. They could have avoided all that catastrophe. Not for our sake, as I say, for their own sake. But this has to be, if possible, a historical lesson for people. If you don't do something, you are going to suffer. The fourth element is the element of political alliances. Political alliances, first of all, with countries that are not totally corrupt in the Muslim world, that can help. Indonesia, Tunisia, and some others. In Tunis, there was uh, quite recently, actually, I mean, Tunis is not, you know, a parliamentary democracy, which, you know, wonderful, etc., etc., not at all. But, when the Saudis wanted to establish madrasas there, the Saudis are preparing for radical Muslim madrasas that turn against them, okay? Uh, the Tunisian president wrote a letter to the Saudi king saying no. He 
said, what do you mean? No, you are a Muslim country. We want to pay for it. How can you say no? And he, he, he answered the second letter. We have those letters. In which he said, no, it's no. We don't want you here. Now, Tunis can afford that. You know, it's far away from Saudi Arabia, relatively speaking. It's only a few hours by flight, I know, but still, it's far away. They could afford to do that. Anyone who can do that should be encouraged to do that. So that's number four, political alliances. Uh, Birmingham Temple can't do that. But the United States government, perhaps under, under a different leadership, might or might be helpful in doing that. And then you see your relationship with Europe. Anti-Semitism in Europe comes with anti-Americanism. They are two inseparable uh, parts of the same thing. And anti-Americanism doesn't go against McDonald's. It goes against Bush. And they are much too well-educated and much too intelligent to think that just change of a personality in the White House will completely change everything. So they are careful, and they are skeptical, and they are themselves in big trouble, as I told you yesterday. And there is not the U European Union is European, all right, it's not a union. They fight with each other, but less so than they did in the past. And there's one government, at least, that understands what it's all about. Paradoxically, those are the Germans. Hmm? When I have big problems today in whatever I do, I go to the German government. Because they learn something from their history, you see. And I'm not anti-German, I'm anti-Nazi. Although at that time, almost all Germans were Nazis but their grandchildren are not. There is Nazism in Germany, of course, but that's a small minority. And so Germany would be an ally. Switzerland is an ally. Sweden is an ally. They are small countries. Don't disregard small countries. They add up, you know. And then you have Latin America just next door to you. Those are alliances that might work, or that might work in part. And then you have another, I think, very major issue. And that is that in your own country, you have radical religion, not only on the Muslim side. In the, the Muslim community in this country, radical Islam is a tiny nothing. But amongst evangelical Protestants who support the kind of policies that I think are wrong, and they are good people, they are wonderful people, uh, that is a major problem that people like yourselves, in coalition with others, might address. We as secular Jews are different in our belief systems from other Jews and they are different in their belief systems from yet other Jews. But there are things that we know how to combine about. When there's real danger to our communities, then uh, the enemies make no difference. If the radical Muslims were ever to gain power, their first victim would be Amir Hussein. The second victims would be all of us here. So we are in the same boat. My last point, and I was asked to keep it short, and rightly so, because, you know, too much talk is, is too much talk. <laughs> is my... Yeah, funny, I, each time I come here, I find myself speaking about it. And then when I 
go and people say, why are you so pessimistic? And next time they say, you are right, but I hope this time you'll be more optimistic, I won't. <laughs> now that is about the Israeli-Arab conflict. Because that is part of the trigger for radical Muslim anti-Semitism, anti western And there is something very real there. There is nothing more interesting than an argument between two people who agree with each other. <laughs> so, when yesterday Professor Lester made his comment about Hamas, I thought to myself, but you're saying exactly the same thing that I did. Except you make a different emphasis. Now, you were there in 1988. That's the charter of the Hamas, more or less. You said they are, they are not going to change their views. I quite agree. Of course they won't. So let's talk to them. They hate us, they want to destroy us. Of course they do. We know that. Do I want them to remain? Do I want to recognize them? I don't. I think they are potential murderers. I think they are terrorists. They are firing rockets. It's Zerot, and my daughter works there. And all, and all the settlements around. I know that. What do I want to talk to them about? About a temporary halt in hostilities. Five years, only five years, anything can happen in five years, you know. And the right wing in Israel will answer, yes, but they are going to collect weapons in the meantime. They are going to arm themselves. But what are they doing now? <laughs> I mean, you know, the nonsense that politicians speak is absolutely amazing. If we had a five-year temporary truce, in that truce, you know, the old Yiddish joke that... Uh, the, either the uh, poets will die, or the dog will die, or I will die. But something will change, you know, in five years. I don't know. Five years is a very long time. It's also a very short time. And in the meantime, not only they can rearm, and not only they can make propaganda and so on. Because the main point that people miss is propaganda. It's not a nice word. It's absolutely essential. That's what they do very, very efficiently amongst their own population. As people pointed out here, they don't listen or view English television or French or even Russian. They view it in their own languages. You need to have propagandistic tools not run by non-Muslims, but by people who are convinced that it's their job, their task, to spread more moderate views amongst this huge society, or these many huge societies. People like myself were asked before the Lebanese war last year, well, what should we have done when they killed eight soldiers and captured two, whose fate we don't know about until this day. What should have we done? Sit quietly? I said, who said so? First of all, and this, this was something that, you know, I wasn't the only one. There was a whole group of people who said this. Uh, well, you, of course, you have to react, you know, uh, militarily. So uh, you send out some bombers and you bomb a few places and then you come back and say, well, we are willing to talk about releasing those two soldiers. And then you create political pressure in the whole world on the Hezbollah in order to negotiate. The Israelis only also symbolically reacted, now, okay, now what, what can we do? And in the meantime, prepare a proper military reaction if that is needed. And it may have been needed. As I told you, I'm not a pacifist. It may have been needed. It may have been unavoidable, but it would have had to be prepared properly. 
And the first preparation and the main preparation would have been propaganda. Send leaflets all over the place. Establish a TV station that will beam to, to, to that population. Make it known what you want and what the other side wants. And make people compare the two sides. Put pressure on the Hezbollah. Instead of them putting pressure on us. Put pressure on the Hezbollah. But we are ruled in Israel by a large by people who are actually very intelligent. And some of them are brilliant. And uh, in agreement with some journalists, we agreed. We are ruled by a group of brilliant idiots. <laughs> because they talk and they read and they react and they have no idea what they're doing. And then they come to the population and in fact admit so, because that is what they are saying to them. We have no answer to the rockets to the rot. We don't know what to do about those two poor fellows who probably one of them is dead, who have been taken by, by the Hezbollah. We don't know what to do about Hezbollah. We are playing games there. Well, in the end we may be reduced to playing games, but at least try to do something that's logical. <coughs> Create allies. Explain your position. Not in Hebrew, in Arabic, and in other languages. Much of the stuff that's coming out on radical Islamic websites is not necessarily Arabic. It's, some of it is in Urdu, some of it is in Farsi for the Shiites, some of them is in Gujarati, some of them is in Turkish. Let me end by saying that uh, uh, what you can do, I, I said, very little, but the little that you can, that you, 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 I think you should. I'll tell you what I do. And it's not an example of what others should do. Because you might say, well, okay, so what, you, what are you doing? Some years ago, we established this website, which all the people here know very well, Memri. M-E-M-R-I, which stands for Middle Eastern uh, Media Institute, Research Institute. It's run by a close friend of mine by the name of Yigal Karmon. He went through the usual stuff that Israelis do, you know, and the army and the Mossad. And, uh, then he did his uh, academic work. I was one of his uh, tutors. And Yigal Karmon said, well, why don't we, first of all, give information? We will translate sites. We will translate newspapers. We will translate TV stuff with professional translators. All, I know all of them. They, they, are, uh, they are, most of them, uh, students of Islamic studies at, the, at Israeli universities. They are fluent in the languages. They they, memory hasn't been caught yet with a wrong translation of anything. And it's all available now in Hebrew, in English, now in German as well. Uh, memory has a board. Uh, I'm one of the members of the board. It's actually sort of directed academically by a colleague of uh, Professor Lassner, uh, Menachem Milson and uh, uh, by some others. It's www.memri.org, and it's open. You don't have to pay anything. It contains TV and so on. Get informed, and then draw your conclusions. Is this half a full glass? Not quite, but you know, the Talmudic saying is, you are not obliged to succeed, you are obliged to try.